Okay, so it was just a few weeks ago, I was playing soccer with my midday group of older guys. Like, all of us have previous soccer experience, but, you know, we're a little older, a little out of shape. But that's good in a way. It's because I could bring Kaylin along, because, as many of you know, my daughter plays soccer, so it's a good place for her to get some good competition in, a little older, uh, playing with a bunch of guys, but just having some good time to improve her game. So usually when we play together, I'm very instructional to her, trying to tell her how to play, where to go and such. And uh, this one opportunity, the ball came to me in a good position, and it was just me, one-on-one -on -one with the goalie, um, carrying the ball to the goal, looking good. I kick the ball at the goal, and it stoinks off the side of the post. And I should have scored, and in exasperation, I yelled out, a word that probably wasn't a good church-going word, right? So I did this in exasperation, but it wasn't until after that happened that I recall that Kaylin was on the field. And I looked over my shoulder, and she wasn't looking. And I had this hope, like, maybe she didn't hear me yell out that word until after the game. As we were driving back home, I said, hey, Kaylin, do you remember when that happened the game? And she, she just said, Dad, I heard you. She heard me. I got caught. Now, uh, I admit this to you, hoping that you will have pity on me. I know you think, oh, he's an ordained minister, theologian type. He, he can't be uh, in the mire and the muck of potty mouth language. But I grew up in more of a blue collar background. I did grow up in church, but we said a lot of things after we left church. And yeah, I, I sometimes don't have the best language. Now, it's interesting, as I was being raised in church then, one of the big things, as I was a young person growing up, I was always taught the, the pitfalls of using potty language, right? Like, this was a high, a high value for my church culture. And one of the texts that, we would, uh, that they would use to instruct us was in James chapter 3. And as you know, we've been studying about James, uh, specifically this theme of doing the work, this idea that James is very much interested in how we live out what we believe as Christians. So in James 3, many Christians look at that as this deep instruction for us to be able to guide ourselves in our language. And in looking at James chapter 3, and if you have that uh, before you, I think you can see James chapter 3. Uh, verses 3 through 6 say, When we put bits into mouths of horses to make them obey us, right? When you ride a horse, usually the strap is connected to the mouth because where the head of the horse is directed is where you are steering it. Or, how about this? Uh, when you put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn a whole animal. In verse 4, or you take ships as an example. Although they are large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants it to go. Verse 5, likewise the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest, uh, what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Verse 6, the tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. So that is one of these biblical verses that you would think just really sets itself up, sets the stage for this idea that, you know, the, the, your, your potty mouth language is bad. Okay, so I'm not here to say that the scripture doesn't say anything about that. If I really wanted to take the time to go into it, I would show you that there are actually words, both in the Hebrew, which the Old Testament was predominantly written in, and in the Greek, that are about as close to potty language as you can find. So it's not like the Bible is this, you know, sterile text. It, it speaks in a modern language of the day, and it, and it is very visceral as it comes across. So it's just not about that, but we would be remiss if we would just think that what James is trying to tell us in chapter 3 is that your tongue could say some potty mouth things and you should knock it off. Because really, 
and more pervasively in Christian teaching throughout the Bible, the power of the tongue is always connected with how we use that in interactions with other people and how we actually use our words wrongly to tear down, to destroy other people. And this is what I appreciate about James. He would read in uh, verse 9 and following. James writes, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And then James says, Brothers and sisters, this should not be. This shouldn't be. So we're looking at doing the work. What does it mean for us to live out faith? And I think it's very relevant for us to focus in on this time, how we use our words to label other people. Even as James writes in chapter 3, is that these are people who are made in the image of God. That's in the Latin, the imago Dei. And the reason that human beings carry a, a higher status among all creation is because we are created in the image of God. Nobody knows exactly what that means, but at the very least, it shows that we have in ours, ourselves as humans the mark of God on our lives. And as a result, we should treat those other human beings with respect. Whether or not they share the same belief system as we do doesn't matter. Because it comes down to how we interact with other human beings. And that is why the tongue can be, a, it's a small thing, but it can also be just, it's just a deadly weapon. And in this day and age, not only does that come into effect then by what we say, right? Like, usually when we have this focus, it's on what I speak out of my mouth. Like, those are how words are formed. But this is different than where James was. It's even though the written word existed back then, literacy rates were far lower and what he could never have anticipated himself, but I would tell you that perhaps the Holy Spirit understood, is the power of how our digital words could impact others. And I think something that we've seen here, and I hope you agree with me on this, but it's, I've observed this in the midst of our quarantine, that we've become separated from people, that separation has uh, allowed us then to forget what it means to interact with people, to talk with them, to live life with them. And therefore, the distance that is created from us spatially usually just means that, okay, we are able to be by ourselves, but in that with a digital access through social media, through all sorts of different venues digitally, we have the ability to still tear down people with our words. And actually, it's even easier because I can speak words about them and perhaps if they're famous, they'll never know it. And then if so, it can start what you know, many of us, is the cesshole that we get stuck into online, right? Like the endless argument conversation within the comments that goes on and on and on, just because we use words. So I feel like I wanted to, looking at James, talk about this. It's like our digital words, how this impacts us. And, and, and for you and I to figure this out, you know, it's always this easier said than done, right? We know we need to do better with our words. But I would just really challenge you this. For how, how many times have you done what James has done as you have teared down the image of God rather than giving him praise. So understand that this isn't James saying, no, everybody's but critique. We just need to have like a rule of nicety. This isn't a rule of nicety, but it is a rule of trying to say, even if that person is wrong, they are made in the image of God. And therefore, if I'm going to correct them, I need to be very measured in the way that I use my words. So I, mean, I just think about how, how, how do we then use our digital words better than we have in certain instances. Just a few things. Number one, I think the biggest thing is us trying to figure out how to control our anger. Because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, y'all. A lot of things that are happening, and it just pushes us. It hits a button, it pushes us to anger. 
And then sometimes our anger is directed at certain people of fame, celebrity, politicians, and we spew that anger. But we forget how oftentimes in saying those things that there are implications elsewhere. Can I give you an example of this? Is that through my contacts, I actually know of a close relationship with somebody who did a vile thing publicly. Like this vile thing was nationally known. It became a national pariah to where if you said this person's name or you tweeted this person's name, that everybody would just be driven to just insanity because what they did was so horrible. And I'm not here to say that, you know, what this person did wasn't horrible, but there, through my relationship, I was able to find out some of the backstories that it was definitely horrible, but probably not as horrible because there's two sides to a story. And I just remember seeing a minister friend of mine going online and just making a quick, easy joke about that very person. And I was, it was interesting because I, I, I was thinking, it's like, do I tell this minister that I actually know somebody who knows that person personally? And I just thought about because of how the algorithms of social media are connected is that could because of my connections, that person about who the minister talked about actually see their social media posts. I, I don't know. But the thing is, is that you have to weigh and just say, why am I so angry? And then what are the implications of that? Controlling my anger. Number two is controlling my pace and my tempo. And what that is, is that you and me stopping and trying to determine then how quickly we respond. And I don't know if this finds you. Sometimes I'll read something that makes me instantaneous angry and then my trigger fingers go to Twitter fingers and I start pushing out a message and then I just want to click send. And what I've tried to do is just like put a timer on my quickness to respond to issues. Usually if I can, I let it lag for at least 12 hours. If it's late at night, I never do that. I let it sit until the next day because I figured out is that if I can, you know, if I am angry about something, and sometimes we know biblically there's righteous anger. If I can calm that down, usually the best thing to help me arrive there is the time. I'm trying to take my time. So unless I am forced to respond quickly, what I've tried to make a habit to do, simmer down, simmer down. Can I tell you the third thing? Third thing is actually hidden here because I talk about James 3. Man, I almost talk about James 3 once a week, but not because of what we've read here, but because of James 3.1. And James 3.1 has become such an important verse in my life as a Christian leader because it speaks directly to how I interact with others. James 3.1. He writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That those Christian leaders who teach will be judged more strictly than other Christians. See, that is a verse that has kept me up at night. And it was one of the things is, as I was a younger leader, I don't think I took the weight and the gravity of what that verse is trying to say. And what that is, is at some point, all of us will stand before God. But when a Christian leader stands before the Lord, the Lord is also going to, to consider the words that they spoke and taught. So it's like every day I understand is that even as I gaze into a camera right now, you think I'm staring into your soul, but I'm staring into a DSLR lens right now. Even as I stare into that, I am in the back of my mind praying to the Holy Spirit to give me words of wisdom that are centered in the scripture and not just rants that I want to give out. Why? Because if I say something that changes the way that you live, then as much as you are held responsible about that, I am going to be held responsible about that. And I never knew until I really got into the church and started teaching things for years is that you just don't understand as a Christian leader how people cling to your words. And that's something I think, though, that even though you may not be in a leadership position, you might not view yourself you might not be an ordained minister. You might not even view yourself as a leader, but I think it's something that you need to consider, and that is who's listening. Who's listening? See, because even when you put something on social media, and you might be directing your anger as if you're speaking to one person, you're not. Your words are reverberating dozens and hundreds and thousands of times to people who will see that, and they will see your words. It will move them. 
and it might project them into even further anger. What you say could have adverse effects. And I think if you just stop and say, would I say this about that person if I was standing in front of Jesus himself? So if I had the other person that I'm angry with right there, and Jesus is sitting right beside us, would I still speak with them in the same tone? And I'm going to tell you something, you know, because oftentimes I preach, hey, I, I got I to gotta improve things. Yeah, I got to fix my potty mouth so that when I get angry, I don't drop that word. One of the things I've tried to discipline my life is never to say junk about other people because if you know what James says, why would I praise the Lord with my words at the same time curse his very creation? I try to keep that out. But then when I'm called to speak, when I need to use words to confront something, am I willing? Am I willing to say what I would do if Jesus was standing right beside me? It's a challenge. It's an opportunity. And it's a never-ending struggle. Friends, that's the thing, is that even as we are distanced, we're talking to people less, our words are actually growing in power. And especially we as the people of God, as society struggles to find meaning in a chaotic world, we need to people be the people whose words are centered in Jesus. It's one of the most interesting stories, and of course I didn't look it up, but I just was thinking about this as talking about James 3, is that Jesus is teaching religious people, people who know, you know, think they know the Lord. And he says something that blows their mind, their paradigm. And as he says it, they start leaving. <laughs> Jesus' words were so convicting that the religious leaders start to walk away. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, what about you all? Will you walk away too? And a disciple responds, Master, to whom would we go? Because you have the words of life. Friends, our words have powerful. They're capable of doing many different things. But what we want to be are curators of words of life. And that's what would be my challenge for you. Can you take the words that the Lord has given you, the, the, the grace to grant you, and can you use them powerfully for, for good, for good things? That's my prayer for us is that our words may be words of life. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this opportunity again, wherever we are, we are as we're dealing with this, to consider the teachings of your servant James. I thank you for the pragmatism that he brings to this because it's not well enough just to have good theology, Father. We have to live this day after day. And we fail. And when we fail, we ask forgiveness. But we implore you to send your spirit to help us do better. Help us do better. Father, specifically with our words, help us to wield words well. Help us to understand that our words have immense power. And Father, thank you for your words, and let those be the words we emulate. Help us. Help us to spread words of life. Words of life. We give you praise. Author, creator of the word. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for... Uh, having this moment to contemplate scripture. After I conclude, we are going to have some questions. Our church is meeting in the backyard. You're welcome to join us at one of our locations. But if you're not there, even wherever you are, here's some questions that we can deal with to help us contemplate James 3 and what we do with our words. Be blessed. Have a great week.